And good evening, everyone, or good morning, or good afternoon, whatever the case may be around this rotating globe. Planet Earth, planet Earth in jeopardy. There's a major conference at the UN this coming week as part of the overall activities. There's a major session on the climate, climate uh, change, global warming. I'm going to touch on that a later in the show. Before we get to my remarkably intriguing subject tonight with an old friend, uh, Rick Spence, Dr. Richard Spence, who does research in the most interesting things. You know, I, I find out new things about Rick all the time, and uh, tonight's conversation is definitely one of them because I have been a, an avid devotee of the myth and history and lore of uh, Jack Parsons for many, many, many years. And that will become kind of clear as we, we go through the morning. I want to start with a couple of items. Remember what the drill is. You go to the other side of midnight.com. You click on tonight's very, very obvious Jack Parsons banner. Um, I found that. I mean, if you look on the Internet these days, you can find anything. But it seems so emblematic of what we're going to talk about because – this is a, a genuine puzzle. Who was Jack Parsons, and how did he come to have such influence over NASA and what NASA has found compared to what NASA has told us? And how did he become one of the key progenitors of probably the most famous NASA laboratory center um, headquarters on the planet – the infamous or famous JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So we're leaving tonight. If you go to uh, click on that banner, which will take you to the guest page tonight for uh, Dr. Spence, scroll down in Radio with Pictures to my first item. Here is a story coming out of a JPL mission to the planet Mars, which is sitting on Mars tonight on the plains of Elysium. Sending back data, twittering back data, if I may use that term. And one of the things that's come out, because there's a major European uh, science conference going on right now, um, is there's mysterious magnetic pulses that have been discovered by the InSight lander sitting there in Elysium. Um, but they're not all the time. Now, Mars, if you, if you haven't been following the story, Mars is... I'm thinking of the Elton John line. But, yeah, besides not being the place to currently raise your kids, Mars is very, very weird. It does not have what's called a magnetosphere. Uh, Van Allen radiation belts, trapped radiation, like the Earth, uh, captures the protons and electrons streaming from the sun in the so-called solar wind. Why does Mars not have a series of Van Allen belts? Because... Mars does not have a regular dipole magnetic field. I mean, you've seen diagrams in textbooks and in newspapers and, you know, uh, documentaries where, you know, you got the Earth and you got a little bar magnet stuck in the, the, the Earth tilted, kind of like the Earth's axis is tilted. And there's a north and there's a south and then you've got field lines going around it. And that's the simple explanation for why the Earth has a magnetic field. Now, of course, there's not a bar magnet. In the in the Earth, that's the that's the analogy, that's the metaphor. There are a system of very complicated uh, swirlings in the liquid outer core of the Earth, the metallic iron nickel outer core, and those in the model create the magnetic fields of all planets. In fact, if you extend it up to stars, the the um, electrically conductive plasmas of stars do the same thing. So we are told. You get to Mars, uh, Mars is, you know, half the size of the Earth, but Mars does not have a global magnetic field. Now, the mainstream explanation for this is that Mars did have a field, and because it's a smaller planet and it cooled more rapidly than the Earth and it no longer has a liquid um, outer core or basically really any radioactive heating from the core to keep that uh, outer, you know, fluid metallic mass liquid. There are no slosh currents. There are no vortices. There is no generated magnetic field because of the spin of the planet, and therefore there's no global planetary magnetic field. 
Now, many years ago, one of the NASA spacecraft, um, um, I, I should back up and say we've never landed, we, NASA, has never landed, or any nation has ever landed a magnetometer to measure magnetic fields on the surface of the planet. We've had a number of landers, you know, going back to Viking. We've had rovers, Spirit, Curiosity, Odyssey, and the Russians have had, you know, landers and They've had no rovers yet, but um, nothing carrying a magnetometer until the InSight, the JPL InSight mission, because this is the mission that's, you know, it doesn't really carry any instrumentation except for um, a seismometer detecting or looking for Mars quakes, a heat flow probe, which has had all kinds of mechanical problems. They can't get the darn thing to burrow like it's supposed to in the surface to give us heat flux readings from beneath the uh, surface of the planet, you know, a couple meters down. But it also carries this very unique instrument for the first time in space history, a magnetometer. So they just published a paper. Um, they're detecting very bizarre magnetic readings. For one thing, even though Mars does not have a global magnetic field, which means you couldn't wander across the surface with a compass and know where north is, that kind of thing, it does have very strong regional regions which have been detected, have been detected, say your words, Hogan, have been detected from orbit to possess magnetic fields of their own. So think of Mars as covered by a series of bubbles of magnetic field strengths with their respective norths and souths. Um, and there's all kinds of ideas for why that is. And what happened to the global field back when the, the field died with the planet dying, with the core you know, freezing up, heat going away and all that. But two things have come out of insight. One is the local field is like 20 times stronger there on the plains of Elysium than was calculated based on measurements by orbiting spacecraft you know, a couple hundred miles up um, as they whip, whipped around the planet. That's the first thing. Very, very strong local magnetic field. The second thing is that every night on Mars, at about midnight, regular as clockwork, the monster field of the surface begins to vibrate, begins to sing, begins to resonate and pulsate with very long period pulses that NASA and the guys at JPL who are monitoring these instruments are completely baffled by what the heck is going on. Now, the fact that it occurs at midnight, I think, is a major clue. So uh, you guys, obviously, tonight, the JPL guys are tuning in because they want to hear what we know about Jack Parsons, who was intimately connected with the formation of JPL, as we're going to get into as the morning progresses. So you're also going to hear right now what I think is going on with this weird magnetic thingy. I think it's due to the hyperdimensional torsion field interaction of the sun with Mars because we see a very similar weird ringing of the magnetic field of Saturn. Now, normally when, when fields pulse, uh, based on NASA's data over you know, the last 30, 40, 50 years, it's because the field, the dipole, the little you know, mythical bar magnet buried in the center of the planet, is tilted with respect to the axis of rotation. So as the planet rotates, this tilted field kind of interacts with the field of the sun, and you get a blip. My magnetometer in imitation there. Uh, but Saturn's field is straight up and down. Of all the planets that NASA's measured, the Saturn field is weirdly, I mean really, really weirdly for this model. I talked about how planetary fields are supposed to be generated. It's aligned within tenths of a degree with the rotational axis of Saturn. So when the Voyagers went by, and Cassini went into orbit. One of the weird things they found in the Voyager missions, which both carried uh, magnetometers flying by in the 80s, uh, Saturn, many, many, many tens of thousands of miles away. One of the things they noticed is that there was this periodic 
wiggle in the magnetic field, this blip, this tremor in the force. Um, but it didn't seem to have a cause because the field of Saturn is so aligned with the spin axis, it's, it, there, there's no difference. So what's causing this periodic blip, blip, blip every 10 hours and something? That's the rotation rate of Saturn. Now we fast forward the film to a planet and a mission measuring that planet, Mars, and the InSight mission on the surface for the first time sitting on the surface of magnetometer and regular as clockwork at midnight, blip, blip, blip. So what's going on? I mean, you don't have a tilted field. You've got a whole bunch of magnetic bubbles all over the surface, but there's nothing that makes one stand. What is causing this periodic modulation of a magnetic field and a magnetic electromagnetic emission, very, very low frequency because of that field relative to the sun. Because, of course, if it's midnight on Mars, that means the sun is 180 degrees away on the day side of the planet, 140 million miles out there, because uh, that's how far away Mars orbits the sun. Mystery. Wow. I also suspect that because we know, you and I, talking to each other tonight, that Mars once was a cradle of an extraordinary series of ancient civilizations. And based on conversations we've had earlier on the InSight mission and some of the orbital photography taken by MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, looking down on the plains of Elysium where InSight is sitting, I have told you before, and I will say it again, that InSight is sitting in the middle of an ancient, ancient, ancient buried Martian city. And we'd see more of it, but the dust and the dirt and the winds and the seasonal sandstorms and all that have blown a lot of stuff around. So it, I, we're not going to see anything from this mission, but maybe, just maybe, what InSight is detecting at midnight, every night on Mars, is the interaction of something in this ancient buried Martian city with the dipole field of the sun and the solar wind, that that's the marker, lonely echoing through space and time, a magnetic signature left over from a distant epoch of a civilization long gone. Think about that. And you guys at JPL who are listening, you can now kind of crank it into your models and uh, see what comes up. In fact, you might even want to tell us someday. Okay, moving on. Item number two. It's happening again. Remember the big flurry last uh, fall of 2018, October, November? The first interstellar object, a mua mua, you know, a messenger from a distant time, which is how NASA described the uh, the um, translation of the term mua mua from the Hawaiian and our old friend uh, Keith Laney, well, he's not that old, member of our imaging team, he went to the uh, Hawaiian um, um, dictionary and found that a muamua doesn't mean messenger from afar. It actually means, you know, a scout of a war party, which, of course, is very interesting if you're paranoid and you're NASA and you're thinking that they're out there and Maybe they're coming here and all that. Well, we've got another one. In August of this year, so you want to click on item number two in my radio of pictures. In August of this year, just a few weeks ago, an amateur astronomer in the Ukraine. Now, this is intriguing. You've seen all the news stories about the Ukraine, the interactions of Ukraine with the current president, Donald Trump, and all. I mean, that soap opera is raging very nicely. Thank you. Well, on August 30th, this Ukrainian amateur astronomer, Gennady Borisov, really, spotted a strange comet at the distant outer edges of the solar system, somewhere, I think, around Saturn, Jupiter, somewhere out there, coming in from the direction of Gemini, the constellation of Gemini. Now, what makes this different, and its technical name is C-2019Q4, we're going to call him Borisov because that's that's the discoverer and that's the protocol. Um, unlike uh, Amuamua, 
which was labeled asteroid, comet, asteroid, comet, Pentagon, which Thursday you're talking about it, because they couldn't detect any emissions, any gas cloud, any coma, any residue coming off this object. So it appeared to be a rock. Problem is, it turned out to be a very bizarre rock rotating uh, every seven or eight hours and modulating a light curve reflected from the sun so dramatically that eventually the model, again, this thing was only seen as a point of light even in the biggest telescopes, but eventually the model was that, that Oumuamua was this long pencil-shaped object tumbling end over end, which caused no end to speculations about what it was. And Oh yeah, as it rounded the sun, because we didn't see it back in um, back in um, uh, October of last year. We meaning the NASA telescope on the top of Mauna Kea that was looking. It didn't see it coming in. It saw it going out, meaning it had already plummeted down about 90 degrees to the plane of the solar system from the constellation of Lyra. We've talked about Lyra with Chris Knowles quite a bit. And it was on its way out, leaving as fast as it came in, never to return because it was the first of what are called uh, hyperbolic objects, objects that are not tethered by gravity to the sun. They make one turn around the sun or they make a slight left hand or right hand turn. Their trajectory is bent, but they're moving so fast that they are literally can never be claimed by the sun, captured in, by its gravity because they're interstellar interlopers. And it, it took decades and decades and decades. These guys had been proposed uh, by astronomers for a very long time. You know, be on the lookout for, you know. Um, but Oumuamua was the first one that they found. And then just a few months later, you know, like almost not quite a year, we've got a second one now. Now, this one is going to be very interesting because unlike Oumuamua, the astronomer crowd with their big, big telescopes from Hawaii to to uh, South America and in the Far East are going to be able to look at this thing for over a year. And it's emitting a cloud of gas and dust. So they'll be able to get measurements of compositions and changes in emission strength as it comes closer to the sun. It's going to be about 1.8 times the distance of the Earth from the sun on December 7th, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And it's going to be closest to the Earth four days after Christmas on December 29th. And it's going to be visible in a small telescope, will not be naked eye object, unless, of course, it really is going to surprise us. But what is so cool, so amazing, based on its trajectory, there is no doubt this thing is coming to us from the stars, from somewhere way, way out there in the galaxy. It's a real emissary from some other star system. Unless, I mean, to me, the coincidence of finding these two objects after decades of finding nothing in this vein is a little bit too coincidental. So is this something that has been sent to us? And if so, by whom and for what reason? And of course, what we want to do is we want to pay close attention to this thing over the next several months, particularly as it gets closer. And then finally, if you go down to link number um, three, um, let me get rid of this. Okay, yeah. link number three. Uh, that's the JPL small body database browser. That's an actual computer program. You can click on it. You can you know look at various elements of the comet's orbit. You can actually see an animation as it goes, moves around the sun. It's entering at a 44, 45 degree angle to the central plane of the solar system. So it's going to be well placed for visual observations beginning. It'll be far enough away from the uh, sun, you know, dawn, that kind of thing by October. And from then on for the next several months, it's going to be spectacular astronomically for the professionals, intriguing for amateurs and maybe really surprising to the average citizen who's just kind of hearing this for the first time. Stay tuned. Well, um, this is going to be one interesting event that obviously JPL is going to play a major role in. 
because we have spacecraft out there. They're going to take spacecraft observations. Um, it has a lot of professional astronomers and planetary scientists who are intrigued with comets because they're supposed to be the building blocks of the planets of the solar system. So JPL is going to be up to their eyebrows in uh, Comet Borisov as the months go on, which is a good place to segue to my guest of the morning. Because the morning we're going to talk about Jack Parsons, John Whiteside Parsons, with uh, an old friend, Rick, Rick Spence. And this is the guy who is basically responsible for the creation of JPL, and thereby hangs a tail. So tonight is a time and a, and a story of mystery and magic, and we shall return. Dr. Richard Spence is professor of history at the University of Idaho. His interests include Russian and military history, uh, along with espionage, occultism, and anti-Semitism. And I think we're going to cover all of that tonight in one show. His major published works include Boris Sakhanov, Renegade on the Left, Trust No One, The Secret World of Sidney Riley, Secret Agent 666, Aleister Crowley, British Intelligence, and the Occult, and Wall Street and the Russian Revolution, 1905 to 1925. He is the author of numerous articles in Revolutionary Russia, Intelligence and National Security, the Journal for the Study of Anti-Semitism, American Communist History, The Historian, New Dawn, and many other publications. He's been interviewed on many, many programs and has been the commentator consultant for the History Channel, the International Spy Museum, Radio Liberty, and documentaries produced by the Russian Cultural Foundation. And he is the kind of resident historian of The Other Side of Midnight. Rick, welcome back to The Other Side. Great to be on, Richard. Well, where should we dive in? Because I wanted to give some background on the extraordinary importance of this facility called JPL which permeates the last 50, 60 years of the American space program. And it just seems so appropriate that we're talking as this new mystery coming from one of the JPL missions is kind of cascading around the world regarding Mars, that we kind of delve into the history of how this facility got founded and the key person who was involved in its founding, its creation, John Whiteside Parsons. So where should we begin? Well, I don't know. Maybe we could begin with a little detail that Jack Parsons or John Whiteside Parsons wasn't actually John Whiteside Parsons. Oh, that's a good place. Um, yeah. Um, he was actually – his name, his real name that he was born under was Marvel Whiteside Parsons. Oh, his poor parents. <laughs> well, I, but, but see, he, he's named after his dad who was also Marvel. 
Oh, and by the way, his dad later goes in, has a career in the U.S. Army, and at one point he is Captain Marvel Parsons. So, Oh, you're kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I am not kidding. You cannot make these things up. Well, you can, but they're good if you don't. Yeah, so he's born in uh, in Pasadena, California, as Marvel Whiteside Parsons. The Whiteside comes from his mother's family. Uh, his mother's family were sort of Pasadena royalty. So, I mean, Pasadena, I think, is still a nice place to live today. But uh, if you go back to 1914, when Parsons is born, go back to the early 20th century, you know, back when – you know, L.A. was much smaller than it is now, and all those little towns like Pasadena and others are not so little towns were actually separate towns. Pasadena was in some ways kind of the – one of the first affluent Los Angeles suburbs. I'm not sure that they would like that term. But it was, it was a town all on its own. But it was noted for being uh, – somebody called it the, the uh, West Coast Newport and what they were comparing it to was Newport, Rhode Island, which was the kind of yep. gathering place yep. of the yep. East Coast. Yeah, Pasadena is uh, nestled famous. there. It's nestled under the San Gabriel Mountains. Yeah. Which, when the weather's clear, is is beautiful. Um, that's one of those things that I think a lot of people. I don't think the smog is as bad as it used to be, but it's still one of those <clears> things <throat> that um, I can remember my grandmother telling me about this, who lived in L.A. and around Pasadena in not in 1914, but in the 20s and 30s. Is the first time she saw it. It was just one of the most beautiful things she'd ever seen because the sky was this, you know, Maxfield Parish blue. It was like painting she'd seen, and the mountains and the wildflowers and. Yeah, I think in particular for people coming, you know, as she did from, you know, the Midwest or other areas, not that there's anything wrong with the Midwest, <laughs> but nevertheless. It's just um, a bit flatter than California. It's just a bit flatter and maybe a little colder and windier and more dismal. But uh, it, it, she was really, uh, really, I think, blown away by that. And I think a lot of people were. And it's, it's something, I think, later on that you know, not just with air pollution, but with the whole build up the area that really sort of gets lost is, is the kind of sheer sort of sort of Mediterranean physical beauty that Southern California and that area had at that time. So he's born into a, a what was then a, a wealthy family. His mother's family was wealthy. His father, uh, Marvel Parsons, was from Massachusetts. And his first appearance in California was about a year earlier than about 1913. He came out, you know, he's another one of these Easterners who came west and uh, saw the whole L.A. basin in its, in its early glory. He was a car salesman. <laughs> so, hmm. uh, and somehow I think he, his, his family was also, the Parsons were fairly prominent back east, but he married, uh, I think, Adeline um, Whiteside, uh, but they were only married very briefly. Uh, basically, she got pregnant, gave birth to the child. It was named after his father. And then the parents split up, and that was the end of the family. Parsons never knew his father. He only met him maybe twice, maybe three times later on as an adult. Mm. So remember, his father disappeared from his life uh, when he was still a baby, and Parsons will not see him again until 19, about 1937, 38. I'll tell you what, we're at the bottom of the hour. Hold sure. it there. Good place to tease. This is going to be a night of mystery and magic and maybe, well, including magicians. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return. Access to exclusive member benefits. 
listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership cost $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Support the broadcast that provide you with the most interesting conversation available. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the other side of midnight for this Sunday night, the 29th of September. The year is flittering, just just going by. Where it is going? Where is it going? Anyway, Richard. Um, uh, so he, he he's born of parents who basically mom skips out, dad. Well, dad dad disappears. Yeah. I'm sorry, dad disappears. Uh, yeah. The the Marvel disappears marvelously. Um, how did he wind up changing his name? Well, his mother so hated his – I mean, let's put it this way. The, the separation of his mother and father in their brief marriage was uh, tempestuous, and she never forgave her husband Marvel. In fact, she would tell her son that his father was dead. Hmm. Uh, she's, you, can, you can look at city directories from the 1920s, and she lists herself as a widow. Uh, I've seen a passport application that she made in the 1920s, and uh, it's asked about – she says at one point I was married and says his whereabouts are unknown. So for years, she apparently told her son that his father just didn't exist. His father was dead. His, his father was a non-entity. And she was not going to call him by that man's name, you know, which was probably a good thing because – I think even, say, in the 1920s, Marvel was probably a problematic name for a boy to have, but it's different than Fliss. Uh, I wouldn't name someone Marvel, but then that's just me. Well, there were, so a lot of names began... back, there were a lot of names back then that we're, yeah. we're no longer using, so we have no idea how why – was, why was the original Marvel named Marvel by his parents? I mean that's – I don't know. His, his father's name was Charles. <laughs> Very prosaic. Um, and and by the way, Marvel's middle name, maybe just to balance this out, was Harold. So his, his dad's name was Marvel Harold Parsons. Wow. But he went by uh, Marvel in his, his military career, uh, although I've noticed in various things that he gets misspelled a lot because I, I don't think it was a, a name people would encounter. So sometimes I think I've seen it spelled Marble, M-A-R-B-L-E. Hmm. You know, someone would hear it and go, uh, it must be Marble. But uh, so dad disappears uh, for years and years, goes, goes, by the way, moves back to Massachusetts, goes into the army, remarries, has another son. So hmm. Jack Parsons has a half, a half brother that, again, he doesn't meet until that boy's a teenager and, and he's an adult in, in the late 30s. Um, his mother simply began calling him Jack. So he was Jack before he was he's originally Marvel. And then he gets the nickname Jack, which, of course, itself is a nickname for John. And so on things like school forms and other documents, he simply became John Whiteside Parsons. But that's not the name on his birth certificate. Uh, and that's so it's, it's always these it, – it's a, a, the type of thing that I'm, I'm often interested in in terms of how a person's identity is sort of created. And, and one of the things you look for, one of the things that often affects that is is a, is a person's name. I mean, that's that's who we are. Yep. I mean, that, that's what we that's what we respond to. And uh, you know, whether you really love your name or you're you know just accept it or you really hate it, one way or the other, it tends to shape who you are. So you've got this. He grows up, let's say, in even for the early 20th century, a a different family. Uh, it's not you know, there's no father present. Um, 
He believes that his father is he's kind of an unspeakable person in the family. Uh, also, his mother divorced his father, which is which was uncommon for the time as well. Mm. If, if, if anybody's under, I mean, apparently what happened between them, there's nothing too mysterious about that. He cheated on her, ah. and she really she really didn't like that. So some people can accept that sort of thing. Apparently, Madeline Whiteside could not. Uh, so that was the whole issue. So there was no staying was together. Birthday. There was no staying together for the children. And no. Th- and no. Th- this must have had a shattering effect on young Jack. Well, I mean, you brought up an interesting point there. I mean, it's in a time and place that rightly or wrongly, a woman like his mother could have decided that, well, no matter whether this guy cheated on me or not, no matter whether I can whether I can stand his touch, nevertheless, for the sake of propriety, and keep in mind this was a wealthy, socially prominent family that she came from, for the sake of propriety and for the sake of some sort of balance of the boy's life, will will maintain at least the appearance of a marriage. She was not going to go for it. Did they live uh, on Orange she, Avenue there in, in Pasadena? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, uh, folks, yeah. uh, for, for those who've never been to Pasadena, and I, of course, went there a lot because I used to go to JPL a lot. Pasadena is this rich, royal, upper crust town with a avenue of royalty, Orange Avenue, which has more mansions per block, although they're not arranged in block. You've got these beautiful stately houses with lawns and manicures and topiary and gates and fences. And it, it, it's just, it, just driving along is just a, a marvelous experience. And back in those days, all that glamor was surrounded by orange groves. Rick, do we lose you? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh no. there you are. Yes, so that's how it gets its uh, it gets its out uh, it, its uh, its name. Yes, he he grew up he as a child he grows up in relative affluence. His his grandfather is still quite wealthy. All that's going to change though in 1929. Oh yeah, because I think his grandfather is dead by then, and then he and his mother lose almost all of their money, and they have to move out of the very large house they were in, rent it out to strangers, and they move into the carriage house in back. Mm. Basically, they move into what had been the servant's headquarters. Now, keep in mind that the carriage house in those days was as big as a modern uh, middle-class uh, suburban, you know, yeah, it, bungalow. It's, it's, it's not... It's not tiny, no, and no. you know you don't want to give the impression that they're reduced to uh, you know some sort of Oliver Twist like you know Dickensian poverty, but it was a it's a big come down. I mean you know if, if you're used to being wealthy, well how how wealthy was he as a child? Here's here's another thing that's sort of weird about his childhood. He's an only child. He has no siblings. His mother never remarries. Uh, they, they're fairly isolated. Apparently, she was kind of picky about who she would let him play with or associate with. So he is the kind of quintessential lonely boy. Mm. He's essentially surrounded by his mother, his grandparents, I think a couple of aunts, uh, has little contact with other children, especially male children. The servants they have in the household are English and therefore apparently spending a good deal of his time Speaking to the servants, he actually picks up this kind of British accent in Pasadena. So then mom takes this kid who's, when I say, is not well socialized, is, you know, indulged, somewhat overweight as a child, um, is, you know, never really been involved in rough or tumble play. And the other thing is that his grandfather apparently every day would give him $20. And in those days, yeah, that, twenty dollars—that's a lot was, of money. It's like it's like almost probably a thousand bucks today. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's at least you know it's, it's like giving him a, you know a hundred bucks, if not more. I mean, a twenty dollars. If you keep in mind that the average here's here's a comparison, the average hourly wage in this period was about sixty to seventy cents an hour, and this kid gets twenty dollars a day. And he would carry it to school. Well, what do you think is going to happen to this kid who's socially awkward, mm-hmm. slightly chubby? He becomes very, money, very, very straight. popular. 
Well, not exactly. He's going to walk into a nest of wolverines who will take that money away from him and beat him up. Well, that's so, not, a, not a good outcome. Not a good outcome, but you know he's going to walk into the uh, you know the, the the tangled bank, the uh, the tooth and claw jungle of the American educational system. <laughs> and you know, I mean, kids are. I think many of this can remember it. You know, it's um, vividly. They're, they're little an- they're little animals. Yes, okay? yes. And and if they sense someone is different. Uh, you know, if they smell blood in the water, weakness, whatever it is, they will go after them. Not all of them. Remember that, the other ones will stand around it. Yeah. Remember that famous book in the 60s, The Lord of the Flies? Yes. <laughs> so he does not have a happy childhood at school. So his mom at one point decides that she's going to take him out. Uh, she's going to take him out of school where he's just being bullied incessantly. And uh, she sends him for a while to a uh, – uh, military school in San Diego. I can't remember the name of the military school, but it was it was regarded as the West Point of the of the uh, West. And he gets kicked out of there pretty quickly. Uh, he doesn't get along with anybody there either, and that's where he begins to take an early interest in explosives, or at least in fireworks, where he blows up the toilets. <laughs> so. I don't know if anybody remembers that, flushing cherry bombs down toilets. That's not a good thing it, to do. To it the used to system. be a big deal at MIT, I remember, just in the <laughs> <clears throat> Well, that gets him kicked out. And that, that's kind of a turning point in his early life because it was later described that when he, when he then comes back into school after that, I think this, this was probably around you know, that awkward middle school period, and he comes back into high school, he has a kind of newfound confidence Basically, from getting kicked out of military school, hmm. um, it was one of the. But the other thing about it is, it's sort of the an early manifestation, I think, of of Parsons' contrarian nature. Because what we're talking about here is, we're, and one of the reasons we're, you know, spending time talking about his childhood is because remember, it's always true that the child is the father to the man. All right, you want to understand at least to some degree, why an adult behaves the way they do, you would best look at their early experience. Mm. And here we've already noticed that there are a lot of a very unusual thing about Parsons' upbringing. It is not typical. He is not the typical American boy. He does not behave in the typical American boy way. Um, he is, and, and in a way that being kicked out of military school was something that he just decided that he was going to do. Uh, he also, when, when he was bullied in school, uh, there was an older boy that, that befriended him. He was two years older, a guy named Ed Foreman, who's probably going to be his closest friend for the rest of his life. And, and in fact, one of his chief collaborators uh, at Caltech and, and JPL. Uh, and Ed Foreman met, uh, and, and basically it was just an older kid that came in and stopped other kids from beating him up. Uh, and that was one of the few sort of acts of, I suppose, spontaneous kindness that he had received. And he kind of bonded with Foreman. And Foreman became not a father figure, but a kind of older brother. And, and they'll stick together. I mean, they'll have lots of differences. Foreman and Parsons are very different people. Foreman is much let me, more. Uh, let me ask a question yeah. at this point, because it seems to me that as a mama's boy, as part of yeah. Pasadena elite, with money – to burn, literally. Him being bullied, being the victim, is so antithetical to the idea of that class of people thinking they're better than anybody else and using mm-hmm. his money to basically buy friends, to buy influence, to buy whatever he wanted. I mean, he had an unlimited supply of money. How come he was bullied and the victim? Was this the product of his being a, quote, mama's boy? Well, you brought up that term, uh, which, you know, that's exactly what it was many people described him as, that he was he was kept very, you know, I suppose he was tied very closely with his mother's apron strings. Um, she, He was, you know, think of it this way. She didn't have, in the context, she didn't have a husband. Her, her older parents were dying. He was, you know, there was a huge amount of her attention. In some ways, a huge amount of, the, of this woman's energy is directed on her sole child, hmm. uh, and she is over. You know, she is to his detriment. Him, overly, to his detriment, um, and it was one of those things. You know, the reason he another person with that amount of money 
and with a different approach or personality could have turned that situation to his advantage. He might have had his schoolmates, instead of bullying him and beating him up and taking his money, he might have had them on his payroll. Well, I'm thinking, as, Carson, you, as, as you're yeah. talking, I'm thinking of John John and Jackie Kennedy. And, you know, John Kennedy didn't leave. He was murdered. But John John was a real problem. And, and Jackie's answer was to send him west to a dude ranch to do hard labor under a foreman who became a kind of a surrogate older, older, older brother. And that turned John Jr. into this really interesting three-dimensional guy, ultimately founded George Magazine and looked at politics. And I mean, in other words, completely different way of handling the mama's boy problem. I think early on Parsons was just, you know, either due to, you know, we'll blame everything on his mother, however Freudian that becomes. But it, it, <laughs> he was he was he was socially inept. All right. Hmm. I mean, it's a different. You know, one person can walk into a situation and they can turn it to their advantage. Someone else will walk into that situation and they don't, just don't know what to do. And my impression is that when he was faced with, I mean, first, for a kid who isn't used to being around other children. For someone who isn't used to being, well, in some ways, isn't really used to dealing with aggression. Um, so he was so sheltered that, that he was kind of shell shocked when he was thrown into. I, I, I guess you're talking public school. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can relate to that to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was an only child for like the first ten years of my life till my sister came along and ruined everything. But nevertheless, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. but. Hopefully but she's one of the not things listening that, tonight. I, I, I did, you know, I, I did have uh, other, uh, uh, you know, teammates uh, and so on. Again, around. for the audience, all of this is crucially important as we get into what Parsons is now known for and his extraordinary influence. I will maintain on the history of of NASA and our exploration of what's really out there. It's, it's, you know, I, again, uh, one of the things that I encountered actually from a cousin, from a distant cousin at a family reunion, I can vividly remember this. I don't know how old I was, five, six. My sort of first experience with unprovoked aggression is that and I was basically introduced to this kid, and he just walked up and decked me. <laughs> well, that's a, that's I mean, an intro. Just hit me, hit me square in the chin and knocked me down. And, and no one had ever done that before. And and I can just remember thinking, you know, like what, what, you know, what happened? What is this? And so my my first tendency wasn't to sort of jump up and hit him back, but it was just to sit there and try to figure out what 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 what's what's going on? Mm. Why did he do that? Why did he hit me? And um, you know, I eventually learned, and and Jack Parsons eventually learned, but that was one of those things that was a difficult lesson for him. He did, other than having you know Ed Foreman comes along and sort of becomes an older brother, and then. There is, you know, he didn't get sent to a dude ranch, but remember, his family lost its money in the and crash. He then had to, yeah, in the crash, and then he had to go to work, basically, uh, right out. I think he graduates from high school around thirty-one, and he goes to work in order to support his grandmother and his mother, um, who only had some residual income. He goes to work for a an explosives company for the Hercules Powder Company. Hmm. And I mean, here's another one of these things that's interesting about Jack Parsons, of you know, connected to the JPL, someone who was you know an inventor, uh, an engineer. He he has no regular college education. He holds no degrees. Hmm. Never got a degree in anything. Hmm. So he briefly attended Pasadena City College. He took some chemistry classes in the early 30s at Stanford, but he had to drop out because he couldn't afford to go. Uh, that's when he was working in the Bay Area for Hercules Powder. But one of the things that he learned, he, he'd had, you know, probably since those days of blowing up toilets at the military school, he had an interest in explosives. So the thing about, about Parsons, really, I mean, if you want to think about what sort of scientific or professional niche he fits in, he's basically a chemist. That's what he's interested in. He's interested in chemistry, and especially he's interested in explosive substances. 
So he gets a job with Hercules, and at Hercules, he's working 12 to 16-hour days. But one of the things that he's learning about are explosive compounds and how you handle them and how you mix them. And there's one – can't remember the guy's name, uh, but there was an older worker that he was placed under. Because remember, this is an explosive you know, This is one of those jobs that you have to do things right or you're dead. Yeah. And probably everybody else in the building is. So he was put under the wing of an older worker who basically said, look, kid, this is how you're going to keep yourself alive. And this is how you're going to make money for the company. And this is what this substance is. And this is what this stuff does. And this is what happens when you mix these together. And this is something you never, ever want to do. And this is something you should always be careful about. So he became an apprentice and, to a guy who took him under his wing. Right. And, and But Parsons learns this and, and then he begins to experiment with things. Once he begins – the thing about Parsons, remember, is that he's not someone who learns these things at school. You know, and I'm saying this from the standpoint who's a professional educator, a professor of history. <laughs> you know, my, I spent my life in and around school, schools. I, I, I teach people in schools, and schools are very useful. On the other hand, there are some people for which, in a way, schools are almost unnecessary. They're, they're almost a kind of – I'm not even sure that Parsons – would have functioned that well in an academic environment because it would have meant that he had, would have to take orders from people that he might not take orders from. Parsons was perfectly willing to subordinate himself to people, but it had to be that person. You know, it had to be someone like I don't know, Aleister Crowley. You know, mm. He had to choose the he had to choose his masters. He didn't want his masters imposed on him. Parsons is an example, basically, of just a natural-born genius, someone who had the intellect to be able to assimilate a great deal of information quickly, but not just assimilate the information, but then begin to organize that in new ways. Yes, it's sometimes said that the, one of the things that you know separates genius from, I suppose, less or ordinary mundane intelligence is that a genius sees things that aren't there. Aren't they? He sees things that aren't there and sets out to create them. They, they, they see beyond what it is that they have learned and they begin to assemble things. And so working for this, you know, essentially an explosive chemical company opened the door. to It gave him the practical tools and knowledge about, you know, what fulminate of mercury is. And mm. well, you should never drop it on the floor. <laughs> uh, you know, no, bad what, move, what bad move. You, yes. Yes, you know, you know, nitroglycerin, you know, what happens when it's leaking out of the dynamite? Okay. So mm. those are all the but then he but then he the rest of his career is really I mean this this is the basis of where he'll eventually come up with his great discovery which is solid fuel rocket engines. Yep. Uh and then the other thing that he he's fascinated both he and Ed Foreman are big sci-fi fans. Okay, they're reading early. I, I thought it was interesting when uh, one of the first set of books that um, that Jack Parsons read were Edgar Rice Burroughs' Martian novel. Oh my! So there's yes. where Mars comes yes, into yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. So he soaked up Burroughs. He soaked up John Carter of Mars. Uh, he developed. You know, he had this. Again, think of it this way: this is a kid who, for much of his childhood, didn't have a lot of playmate, playmates, and therefore he had imaginary friends. He created this world around himself, and he read lots of books, and then he fantasized about those books. Well, he lived in a world all, apparently, Rick, uh, uh, almost with no intellectual straitjackets. He could see and imagine anything without anybody telling him, you can't do that. Yeah. Okay. I mean it's one of those things that's always kind of dangerous to do with children is not to control them. Hmm. But on the other hand, it's – I mean, you often find this in kids, you know, where kids are sort of the ones that are left on their own devices and manage not to set the house on fire or drown. <laughs> um, that they they often emerge with this, uh, they, they're, their intellect can sort of develop in ways that um, uh, that wouldn't necessarily happen under strict circumstances. I mean, Jack Parsons is not the kind of kid that I would think that would ever have done well. Let's say in a strict. Catholic parochial school. Oh no. Okay. No. Not that there's anything, but that just that he he wasn't the type of person who would have dealt with that. In the same way that he didn't do it, he rebelled. One of the things that this 
this military school experience did is that it it so irritated him or it so affected him that he actively rebelled against it. I mean, he deliberately blew up those toilets to get himself kicked out. Mm. He made that kind of, and and he was furthermore not ashamed of what it was he was done. <laughs> he was proud of the fact that he had defied these people and essentially escaped them. So he's a you know he's he's simply this this genius who's assimilating this this information and the, and it combines together you know this these all these childhood interests and and you know and one of the things you're reading about in the science fiction even this period are spaceships of you know and and things like like Burroughs' books give them the whole idea of life on other planets and you know how could you possibly reach there well you'd have to have spaceships and then one other element gets added in occultism. So again, a child, inquisitive, intelligence, budding genius, lots of time on his hands, relatively little supervision from his one parent. Uh, and what he has uh, is he began to take into, you know, one of the things you come across in, you know, in fantasy stories and science fiction, even in sort of adventure stories, is the whole idea of mysticism, what we now call the paranormal magic. And that fascinated him. And I mean, here we get a kid who's fascinated with practical science. He's fascinated with these and he's and he's fascinated with the idea of of magic. So supposedly, this is one of the stories he would tell. As a child, and I'm, I'm pretty you know like eight or ten, maybe maybe adolescent. He tries. He later said that what he tried to do his first experiment with this was to summon the devil in his bedroom. So he apparently tried that, and there seemed to be a couple of versions to whether or not it didn't work or it did kind of work and, you know, sort of frightened him in any particular way, but also was exciting as well. He also makes some reference. Later on, he writes this kind of uh, – he really attempts this kind of psychoanalysis later on towards the end of his life. He, he writes what he thinks – he talks about himself in the third person and discusses you know, all the things that he thought had, had affected him. And sometime about the time he was 16, towards the end of high school, around 1930, he talks about an occult fiasco or a magical fiasco. And I'm not certain whether that's another reference to this attempt to summon the devil or whether that's something else, but he was – playing around with these things. I mean, this is a kid who liked to play with explosives and he also liked to play with, you know, maybe the devil if he could. Um, and this is how this whole sort of particular person, see this, this is this child eventually becoming this much more complicated genius, rebellious adult and uh, a leader also, and, a, you know, and a leader and, Go ahead. You know, one of the things that, that he learns how to do, which he didn't, you know, and you can see why from his early experience as a child, arguably, is that he learns how to be socially adept and charming. Boy, so talk about talk that, about a change. Talk yeah, well, change. I mean, you either adapt or you die, pretty <laughs> much. I mean, that's one of the things. So one of the things that you would learn if you're, you know, you have some reasonable smarts, and apparently he did. Is that uh, well? The way that you basically negotiate your way through uh, society is that you you learn to charm people. You be, you become agreeable when it's needed to be agreeable. He also grew up, you know, that the chubby kid grew into a uh, you know fairly lean and and handsome. He was a good looking young man. I'll tell you what. Hold it there. We're at the top of the hour. Sure. My guest this morning is Dr. Richard Spence, and we're talking about magic, the magical foundations, as you're going to see of the most extraordinary interplanetary control center on Earth and, as far as we know, in the solar system. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall magically return. Thanks for listening to this exciting first hour. Now, the second and third hour of the show is available to Club 19.5 members only. Please support the show by subscribing to Club 19.5 and join our very interesting community. To do that, please visit the website, theothersideofmidnight.com, 
and click on the Join Club 19.5 link in the left-hand column. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll gain access to the rest of this show and all previous 350-plus shows that we have done. Now, recent Club 19.5 member archive recording have the commercials removed and the sound quality has been enhanced. You'll also receive a dedicated private podcast feed that contains these enhanced show recordings. And you'll be able to download the MP3 files directly from the archive if you prefer. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll also be the first to preview our new videos and reports. We'll be adding exclusive new features to Club 19.5 as we go forward. And boy, have we got some amazing things to tell you about in the coming weeks. So please support the show and don't miss all the exciting new things we have planned. I want to thank all our Club 19.5 members because without your guys' support, this show would not be on the air. Please help us continue growing the show by subscribing to Club 19.5 today. And when I say we really need you, we really need you. Over and out. <laughs>